morning, good morning. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the second last day of Curiosity Brisbane. My name is Benjamin Law and my official title here is Master of Curious Conversations here at the festival. Um, I'm so pleased that you've all made time for this session today on, on this weekend and I'm so pleased to be joining you here on the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people. Uh, First Nations people on this continent have been making art, discovering science, sharing knowledge here for tens of thousands of years. Together they constitute the oldest continuing civilization this planet has ever seen and we are very grateful to elders past and present that we can still explore science, make art, share knowledge here on what is and what will always be Aboriginal land. Now um, today's session is called how can cross collaboration shape the STEAM conversation? So I'm really interested in this emerging kind of dialogue that we've had for a while where we've, we know STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. But now increasingly we're starting to talk about STEAM. Now what does that mean? Now we're going to illustrate it in a very interesting way because look, whether you watch Sesame Street or RuPaul's Drag Race, you'll know that everyone <laughs> loves puppets. And uh, Dead Puppet Society is one of Queensland's most innovative theatre companies. Uh, last year, however, the pandemic shut down all touring and theatrical performances and the company took a pause to think about its future. Uh, but that pause allowed Dead Puppet Society to expand its repertoire and key to that has been cross collaborating with other skill sets within the world of STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. And what Dead Puppet Society adds to that mix is the A, the arts that turns STEM into STEAM, which is at the heart of so many conversations we're having here at Curiosity Brisbane. Um, so what happens when art and STEM combine? What can these disciplines tell us about each other? And also, where do robotics fit into this conversation as well? Because we have a hunch that this might be the thing that really illustrates um, these kind of abstract conversations for uh, today. Um, our first guest is a writer, director and designer who's worked across British, American and Australian theatre industries. He holds a PhD in puppetry and visual theatre from QUT. He's also a founding member and the creative director of the critically acclaimed Dead Puppet Society, which has been nominated for six Helpman Awards and an Olivier Award. Please welcome Dr. David Warden. Thanks, <laughs> Ben. I haven't heard doctor for a while, that's hilarious. You've got to so use it more, right? I mean, you are technically Dr. David yeah, Morton, know, right? Yeah, Yeah, okay. I love that. You I just... feel like every time it pops up, it hits again like a bit of a bust. Yeah. Go, oh, God, that's right. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Say intelligent those, things. Those, it's got to be legitimate. Those three to four years that I actually spent working on a thesis, you've just erased them from your mind. Yeah. They can be yeah. traumatic things, PhDs. I understand. Um, our other guest is a robotics researcher and educator and distinguished professor of robotic vision at QUT. He's the director of the Arc Centre of Excellence for Robotic Vision, chief scientist of DoraBot, uh, author of the best-selling textbook Robotics, Vision and Control, which is currently being updated, it as is. we understand, <laughs> yep. has won national and international recognition for teaching, including uh, the title of Australian University Teacher of the Year. And he's held visiting positions at Oxford, the University of Illinois, Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Professor Peter Cork, everyone. Thank you. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation because I don't think many people necessarily think of puppetry and robotics in their mind as synonymous with each other. But of course, there are so many opportunities and ways in which they've already merged. Um, David, I want to start with you because uh, if we go into the Queen Street Mall right now, uh, we'll see an incredible sculpture slash installation um, of fish that seem to be swimming of their own accord and when you get closer to the fish they start reacting in different ways. Uh, this sculpture is called Shoal, it's something that you've helped make, you've been a part of the team that has made and driven this. Um, I want to know about Shoal and how it came about and also the backstory of um, why it came about in this particular moment. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Uh, 
perhaps to answer that, maybe I go back in time a little Please. bit just to talk a little bit about the company and you know mm. and how this has emerged from it. Uh, so D Dead Puppet Society has been uh, based in Brisbane now for the last 12 years. Uh, we, we came out of the Queensland University of Technology. Um, and uh, what we try to do with our work is to create a form of theatre that doesn't look like the forms of theatre that particularly the main stage companies are creating. Um, so when we sort of yeah, graduated, we were looking at works that we really enjoyed and found ourselves more drawn to sort of like musical theatre and yet still had the cringe at the songs and sort of like, like what is it that we can make that fits into this sphere that is not just people standing in a living room or next to a kitchen sink talking about their mundane human problems. Um, and so, yeah, we were like, at that point, maybe the grab that we can use for this to create these deeply imaginative stories is puppets. Mm. And um, we don't use puppets in a Sesame Street. I'm so glad you mentioned RuPaul, too. That's hilarious. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, both. Damn it. Um, uh, we don't use puppets in, you know, sort of the, the furry monster slapstick for children sort of manner. We, um, we always use puppets in our performances alongside human actors. Mm -hmm. uh, and we always use them to play characters that a human actor couldn't. So uh, one of our works was about the young life of Charles Darwin mm -hmm. and the animals that he interacted with were all played with puppets. We've done sort of superhero shows where mm -hmm. we've had yeah, roboticized drones that fly around to represent various characters. So our approach to puppetry is always uh, in trying to create mechanisms that can represent, you know, it's not the that it's not the humans. googly eyed version exactly. of an uh, anthropomorphic <laughs> creature, but it might be actually large scale stuff. It might be small exactly. scale stuff um, that we might not think of as like puppets like this, exactly. but is representing something beyond. Totally, yeah, um, exactly, yeah. So I wanted to say that, you know, sort of by way of the form that we use as a company, but um, Shoal specifically as mm. a work, uh, sort of um, my partner Nick, who's here, um, who I run the company with, or who actually runs the company and I tag along most of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can sort this out later, you know, that's guys, true. guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but our work's always been concerned with um, telling stories uh, that are related either to social or ecological justice. Right. Like it's always about, us trying to position narratives uh, of, of individuals or ecosystems that are in points of suffering or collapse and, mm. and weaving narratives around those uh, that make them palatable for a mainstream audience so that you know Joe Blow off the street can come in, can see a piece of theatre or a piece of entertainment, but can gently have ideas seeded in terms of there being different ways for us to engage in the world mm. or, you know, or different means for interaction. Um, so Scholl then <laughs> so picks up you know, those forms of trying to make animal characters a, a living, breathing thing for, for, for a human audience, and then pushes it through this lens of, we couldn't put productions on last year because mm -hmm. of COVID, and yet we still wanted to have a voice, you know, and to be able to say things within, within this sphere that you know, we sort of inhabit. Um, and so Scholl is us trying to humanize a school of blue-green chromis fish whose reef has become bleached. And you know, the, we all know that coral bleaching is going on, you know, but it feels like it's something that's so far and it's so distant from us. So what we're trying to do with this work is go, let's personify these little creatures, let's put them in the heart of a city where we can't escape the fact that they're living in this white coral. Uh, and yeah, and then the, the robotic element within that is um, to make them an interactive creature. So mm. they're not just there and they're not oblivious to our presence. When you approach, they become aware of you. Mm. So we're sort of hoping, I guess, that we're using in a way, the gaze of the fish to remind humans that there are other creatures that inhabit this planet. So what I'm hearing is the work that you've already been doing, doing mm. with, um, with your theatre company is uh, uh, part of it involves engineering at its core level already, right? When we're talking yeah. about the arts and STEM kind of collaborating, it's already a feat of engineering. But with Shoal, you've introduced a new element yeah. with robotics. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it, uh, about six years ago, when we were with the company was working between London, New York, and, and Brizzy, uh, we realised that the fabrication method we were using for creating our sculptures, you know, doing clay sculpts, plaster casts, was just not tenable when we didn't know where we were going to be. In any given mm. month. And so we developed a process for the design of these creatures, uh, designing them all in CAD so that they were purely digital objects and then using rapid prototyping technologies like laser cutting, CNC cutting, plasma cutting, um, 3D printing to, uh, to then mean that we could realize them very quickly. Um, when we then landed wherever that production was going to land. So mm. yeah, it's absolutely this emerging yeah, process that we've embraced. But yeah, this is the first time that the control of those objects has been electric and not um, 
Yeah. Fantastic. Not humans. Uh, well, I want to throw over to the guru of robotics <laughs> that we've got on stage now. Um, look, before we talk about more specific applications of robotics, we've already got one on the stage that we're talking about now. I want to talk more about your interest in robotics, because as I understand it, you originally wanted to be an astronaut when you everyone, grew up. It was right? the era. Right? I grew up in the 60s and yeah, everyone wanted to be an astronaut. It was a time of enormous excitement about yeah. what technology could do. Yes. I think since then we, we realised that it's much, that it is very double edged. Mm. But back then I think it was all upside and so you're still disappointed that I can't go to the space station or go to the moon. Yeah? I, was, I, was, I, was da I was dudded, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe you can uh, go on one of Richard Branson's personal maybe. Pri private A kind of space expeditions. Yeah. That's right. So um, I understand where the, your imagination and how it was captured by uh, astronauts and travelling to space. Uh, when did robotics capture your imagination and why? Robotics didn't capture my imagination really until I got my first job and I was working as a research assistant at Melbourne, at Melbourne University mm -hmm. and you know, I was doing much more esoteric uh, engineering stuff there but for an open day we had this idea of making something that was compelling example of how you get computers to control things so that was kind of my my research interest and so we thought we could just get a little robot and you could buy little little robots you know about this big so you could play you could play a game of checkers mm. drafts right and so that's what we cobbled together with what with that time we called it a mini computer and it's like a cabinet about this big right <laughs> uh, and wrote all the code in archaic computer language to make the robot play a game of drafts. And that was, that was interesting. So I got sort of you know, given carte blanche to, to build the thing and did that. And that was, that was fascinating. So that was the first yeah. time that I'd actually had any, anything, to do with, anything to do with robotics myself. Mm. And then a little bit later, that same year, there was an ad in the paper for Syro. They wanted someone to do robotics. And they had a lab that was just like four blocks away from the university. So, really cool so I applied and I got the job I've been doing robotics ever since so, <laughs> That's really, really great. <laughs> so yeah the short answer is I answered an, answered an ad in the newspaper you know uh, when lot, we used to do that yeah right? yeah yeah <laughs> I think a lot of us depending on your generation when you think of robots you think of um, you know the Jetsons there's yep. a maid doing things that a human being usually would but it's a robot but it's but, also part of the era mm, you know the, the things that you watched on TV there was uh, there was the Jetsons with Rosie you mm -hmm. know there was Get Smart with Jaime Yes. Uh, that was lost in space. So, you know, robots were, they were, they were, they were real. I mean, you saw portrayals of them uh, on television and I'm sure that sort of sunk into, yeah. the, into the subconscious. And they were mostly good. Mm. Right? That's, that's mostly benevolent. Mostly benevolent, yeah. Uh, Until maybe Alien in 1979. <laughs> yeah, and so I guess more, more modern, more recent robot movies explore the, explore the dark the dark mm. side. I mean, to what extent um, is the conversation about, around robotics about striving to get uh, mechanical creatures that can replicate the things we can do? And to what ex extent is the conversation about finding ways to build things that can do things that we can't? I think we're driven by doing the, the, the light on the hill is to create a machine that can do what we can do. Mm -hmm. That's still hard, right? So we're still a long way from that. But as that gets closer, then I guess we're going to start to think about creating machines that are better than us. You, you have to have a long conversation about what better means. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and that's perhaps scary. I think I find that idea a bit intimidating. But I think as that gets closer that we can just build a machine that does what we do, that's then yeah that's the next that's the mm. next frontier now you're particularly interested in how robots can use uh, a sense of vision correct to accomplish uh, a huge range of tasks sophisticated tasks what what kind of tasks are we talking about that rely on that sense if you think about almost everything that we do every day we rely on vision for almost everything so to not have a sense of, of vision uh, is you know is a profound disability handicap for, for humans so a robot that can't see has that has that handicap right mm. so if I wanted a robot you say you know, pass me the pass me the, the bottle of water right what does bottle of water mean? Uh, so, you know, a robot needs to be able to take a, take a picture, and we take pictures with our eyes. 
You know, this is about a 120 megapixel camera that yeah. you've got in your head, right? And then you can process all those pixels, uh, but you don't think in terms of pixels and amount of red, green, and blue. You think about the world in terms of objects. Mm. And that's the, that's the critical bit that's missing. How do you go from a picture to a sense of the objects that are within that scene? Uh, because it's objects that you want to we have a conversation, we talk about the objects in the scene. We don't talk about red, green, and blue pixel mm. values. And so that's an, an abstraction of, uh, of an image. Mm. And that, so that's been my, my big interest. So if I was a robot and I said to the robot, you know, go out, you know, go out through the door and, and fetch me something, the robot has to think about where it can, where it can walk or whether, where it can drive. So it needs to think about where's a flat bit. And it needs to know that there are these things called humans and it's kind of rude to, to run into them or hit them. <laughs> uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's a chair that's in its way, it can push the chair, but not if there's a human on the chair, that would be rude. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of sort of common sense knowledge we have about objects and what they can do and how we can use them. Mm. And a robot, if it's gonna be useful to us, it needs to know all that stuff. Mm. Uh, and we're a long way off from that, but that, that's my big interest. You, you've talked about the human eye in such a memorable way that it's a 120 <laughs> megapixel uh, thing, but it's also such a complex part of our body. For those of us who can see, we t kind of often take that for granted, yeah. the way in which it operates. So I guess a part of the work that you and others do is trying to get machines to not only replicate that, but process what, what they're actually uh, seeing. Yeah. When you say we're a fair way off, how, how far away are you talking about? Look, at the moment we have got systems that we can train. So there's this whole thing you might've heard of called deep learning, uh, which is a way where you don't write a program that looks at all the pixels and says, this particular pattern of pixels means a bottle. What we do is we show deep learning systems a bazillion examples of all kinds of objects, and it learns uh, what, uh, if you show it another picture, it'll say that's a bottle, or that's a cat, or that's a dog. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually write programs to say there's a whole bunch of rules that mean dog, or a whole bunch of rules that mean cat. We train it on examples. And this is fascinating. This is something we couldn't do six years ago, uh, and now it's everywhere. In your phone, you've probably shows faces, puts a box around faces. Yeah. That's done by deep learning. It's a little network, a little ne network of neurons mm. modeled very loosely on our brain that does that. If you've got your photos stored in something like Google Photos and you'd say, show me all the photos I've got of a beach, right? And Google Photos puts up all the photos of beaches. Mm. That's a deep network that's learned uh, to map all those patterns of pixels into semantic labels. And that learning, we can as an, learning as an ongoing process or is, mm -hmm. it, or is it a case of code or algorithms that have been written in and are settled or does the learning continue and update itself? It, it, it depends, uh, but oftentimes you just do a whole bunch of learning and you've got a network and then once you've got the network it's trained, then you can use it. Uh, mm. So you've trained a network on knows a thousand things. You can show it a picture and it'll say it's a cat, it's a dog. Even if it's a sort of dog it's never seen before, yeah. it's fairly likely to say that it's a dog. Yeah. Uh, and we don't quite know how these things work, and that's a little scary. But it's what you did when you were, when you were kids, right? Your parents showed you picture books. We have books. lost control. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you, know, you showed you picture books of cat, dog, sheep, yeah. cow, and that's how we learned. Uh, and that's how, that's today, how we, how we train robots to have these capabilities. Re but there's really cool consequences of that, and that is that we learn stuff. Right? We have a period of our life when we learn stuff, and then we have a period of our life when we're useful and then we die and all the knowledge goes away. Mm. It's not like that for robots, right? Mm. The robots, uh, I can learn a whole bunch of stuff if I was a robot and you could be a robot and you'd learn some stuff and you'd see a new thing, mm. right? So you'd have a learning moment, your network would be updated and you could share that with me. Yeah, oh, okay. <clears throat> right? And they can all be in the cloud. So even when the robot goes to the scrap heap, the knowledge is still there. <laughs> can, the knowledge, the learning of the knowledge the robots have could be this one-way street, it's a ratchet. You mm. could never go backwards. Yeah. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that I find a little bit terrifying because yeah. I know that it's possible. And so we're starting to have debates about, really about, about artificial intelligence. Is it a, is it a good thing mm. or is it not? 
Okay, I want to park that and yeah, return sure. to it, <laughs> partly because you're giving me a panic attack. But um, look, just before we move on, uh, we've we've got David here, mm. and we've and he's brought to us uh, an incredible, beautiful, elegant example of the way in which robotics uh, feed into and create art. Uh, when it comes to the marriage of robotics and art, have you seen some really good examples in your time where you're like, ah? That's, that's robotics applied in a way that I wouldn't have thought of, but within the realm of art that illuminates what robotics can do. So when I, look, I went down and had a look at the, David's installation before, before this session this morning, and I look at it at two levels. One is just this, this wonderful inspired vision of all these little, little fish and you know, the, uh, the reminder about the damage that we're doing to the environment. So I can look at it at that level. The other level, I look at it and say servo motor, serial communication bus, in infrared sensor. <laughs> so I can see the components that are in there and I know what they are and I know how they all work. But I take my hat off to David to be able to put all that together in a way that is, that hides all that, that horrible mm. detail that only geeks think of, <laughs> care about and gives, makes something that, that's deeply impressive. So mm. I think it, I think it's a, a wonderful use of, of technology. Yeah. And I think it's probably something that we should use in the teaching of STEM. I'm an academic at QT, I teach engineering, and it can be a bit dry. And I think you could probably motivate uh, students more by showing them how you could apply this to uh, you know, non-industrial uh, mm. applications. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be an application that's making things or making money. It can just be for the, for the delight. Yeah. Uh, I think that gets lost too mm. often. So you have created this piece that uh, evokes delight. I think it evokes a range of emotions because of what it represents. Um, I wonder though, at the same time, it does involve all those components that you talk about, the, the nerdy stuff, the very technical side of things. This is kind of a world premiere of this installation and any kind of debut involves a lot of trial and errors. What were the kind of challenges and surprises along the way in making this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> first up, thank you, Peter, for the compliment, but I need to bat some of it because he's going to hate me pointing him out, but Lockie, who's sitting in the back, came up with all the technical systems that <laughs> actually make the fish do their thing. Um, legend. <laughs> um, okay. uh, the, I, I think probably one of the, the biggest, um, I want to say roadblocks, fun speed bumps, you know, we came across with, um, with the, the coming together of this work is... Uh, uh, Everything we do as a company is always highly collaborative. You know, we, we love sort of bringing in experts from various fields to, to dream together and to vision, you know, what a, what a work or a product might look like. Um, a part of that process is then that a lot of those, you know, uh, individual elements are developed in isolation or are mm. siloed, and then there's the moment of the, the bringing together. Um, we're very used to doing that in a theatre, you know, where there's set processes and there's set ways of, of bringing those things together. Um, with this, there isn't. Uh, and so I think, you know, that these moments of the, the plugging the thing together, seeing that it works, but then moving it to a new context and the sensors behaving differently. And so I was having to tweak those. And then the way that the weather over the last two weeks has impacted that sculpture, which like, like it's been remarkably uneventful, thank God. Uh, um, yeah. How, how, how does that work, by the way? Because uh, I'm just assuming, I didn't do great at science, but I'm just assuming like mechanical parts and water don't really tend to mix. And you've got an out, yeah. outdoor installation that's actually in the open air. Yeah, yeah. So how have you actually ensured that it can continue working in any kind of weather event. Yeah, so when we, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a couple of things in there. The first is like to try and uh, mitigate the, yeah, the error, do you know, all the explosions. So all of the, all of the, I say explosion, no, I just stopped working, right? Not like a boom, hopefully. Um, uh, all of the wedges that make up the sculpture uh, are all sealed individually. Yep. Um, and they have, yeah, waterproofing strips that are run around them so that when they're crimped together, they, um, it, it stops the water from heading in. Uh, the, the sections that the fish come out of have sort of a multiple part flange that 
gets that stops most of the water from getting in, um, and the thing's also set intentionally on an angle to let the runoff happen. Mm. So there's these things that are in place that we've used to try and stop water getting in. Um, we're also aware of the fact the thing's a greenhouse and it, it gets incredibly hot underneath that perspex, so it intentionally has ventilation built into it to, mm. to move it through. Uh, but then the second layer of sort of defense we've got against it is um, that all of the pieces are very easily easily replaceable. Mm. So we, you know, we have over the last couple of weeks had I think three or four of the servos that drive the fish just give up. And, mm. um, and so yeah, it's about a mid 10 minute job to go under and to pull that section off and to replace it. Wow. And, and it keeps going. So it's sort of like a, yeah, try and avoid the catastrophe and then when it happens, move around it. I mean, you come from an arts theatre background. So how much of this has been like a massive learning curve for you, like essentially becoming an engineer with uh, some side knowledge about robotics? <laughs> yeah, um, I would say like I've just leaned very strongly on my collaborators. <laughs> but sort of as we do in the theatre as well. Um, sure. I think working in theatre though, and I'm yeah, you know this better too as well from the TV work as well. But like we're, we're we are we are crisis managers before we are everything. Yeah. Do you know? I feel yeah. like in a theatrical production, everything is always going wrong. That's sort of how they work, you know. And that's why they're great. That's why they're not films because everything's on a razor edge and there's a yeah gale force wind coming at it constantly to try and knock it off. And the team works to try and make sure that it doesn't. And yeah, so this is um this is that in a different context. Mm. This is that except I'm um, dealing with yeah drunken people coming through the mall at 3 a.m. on a Saturday morning. Yeah, you can protect against the rain, but can you protect against violence and vomit? I don't uh, know. Yeah. So far. <laughs> you know, I, I think you've answered this question uh, throughout the conversation, but when you go from curiosity to curiosity throughout the festival, you see um, these installations or these experiences that marry ostensibly disparate fields uh, that form to make steam. Um, something like uh, Meiwa AR, where you go and you scan the QR code and you look around you and you can see what um, Brisbane, Turrbal and Yagara land looked like prior to colonisation is such a marriage of, uh, we discovered, uh, historians, uh, um, elders, uh, en engineering, tech, uh, uh, algorithms and art, mm -hmm. you know. When it comes to Shoal, what other kind of seemingly disparate disciplines that needed to be married to make to make this work I think uh I think potentially it's um, <laughs> the elements are less disparate in this work that, uh, than they often are in our theatre productions mm -hmm. uh, because the, the the processes that we're making use of to fabricate this you know entity um, I don't know it's sort of they're, they're reasonably commonplace right the use of laser cutting and rapid prototyping um, so I'm going to say no, nope. I just hit a dead end. No, no, no. That's but, 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 That's a short but basically, one. <laughs> I, I, I see like artists, and you've got like w when you're talking about like laser cutting and that sort of stuff. So yeah. technology that you've dealt with prior. Um, it, did you have to bring on new collaborators on board to make this particular uh, installation? what it is? Uh, that's a good question. No, it's actually, actually no, it's the same collaborators but we're working in a different method. Like right. we've all worked together to create performance works but it's sort of, yeah, we're, we're, we're literally pulling the explicit story out, you know, and taking away the, the dark room with lighting and, mm. and putting it in a, a mall instead. But more or less the process for the making of that is sort of largely the same. Mm. Um, as a company though, we have always sort of uh, lent very hard on the fact that the the arts is only one element of what we do and mm. that I think what uh, makes our work sort of stand apart from other works that are you know on offer in the theatre in Australia is that we do lean incredibly hard on designers and we lean incredibly hard on emerging technologies and partnerships with large often multinational companies mm -hmm. that are doing interesting things with technology and how we can embed that within our stories both to make the stories better and more compelling but also to show off the tech. Mm. Um, David, Peter, something that uh, you both have in common, in fact something that the three of us have in common is uh, <laughs> We're QT people, uh, <laughs> alum or current serving <laughs> staff. Um, and I bring that up because, um, Peter, you are the head of something called, uh, is it the QT Robot Academy? Yes. QT, I mean, that sounds really fun. Well, cool. head of, yeah. I mean, I, I'm the only person in the QT <laughs> Robot <laughs> <laughs> And it's, it's a side passion project, uh, which is around <laughs> educating students uh, about robotics. So it's kind of what I would teach a QT, but it's a whole bunch of lessons that I, with a large team of people, um, 
made into an online format mm -hmm. and, and that's accessible to anybody anywhere. I think one of the frustrations with this, this whole movement towards online education are these things called MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. But people talked about a lot, sort of 2000, I don't know, 13, 14, 15, you know, it was heralded the end of universities as we know them because everyone in the world could just go to have, take their courses from Harvard or mm -hmm. Stanford mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. And so I kind of jumped on that bandwagon, but those things were expensive to, to maintain. Mm -hmm. So I made, created a whole bunch of content, about two, 200 uh, short lessons, and now they're all online, they're free. So anybody anywhere can So can we can consider. access it. Yeah, what, yeah. what would we learn as a part of the QUT Robot <laughs> Academy, which sounds like a really great like superhero franchise, but is actually <laughs> an educational course with modules. It, it, it is, it's, it's, there's, no, there's no assessment, so each lesson is quite self-contained. You know, it's sort of five to eight minute video, Peter telling you about a thing. And so there's there about what robots are and why we need them. There's a little bit about ethics of robots. And then there's some sort of quite geeky stuff about what we call kinematics. That's, you know, how arm robots work. And there's a bit about computer vision in there, mm. which is kind of my... My, one of my other passions, so there's that, that's in there. But it's, it's basically a QT third year unit, uh, but it's available in a very easy to digest form, I believe, mm. uh, and it's open, online, free. I'm re, to, to make it online and free is really important to me, and we probably, someone watches a, a lesson every minute, so I don't know how long mm. we've been talking, but so many, you know, so wow. many people have, have watched a lesson. Almost two million lessons have been delivered mm. since it launched in 2017. And it just get beautiful testimonials from people all around the world, particularly in, uh, guess what we uh, in countries, say, like, you know, um, mid in Middle East, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, a lot of Central America, South America. And people just say that, you know, if they, they either don't have the opportunity to go to uni, or if they did have a chance to go to uni, they probably wouldn't have mm. robotics on offer there. And so they can they can get some of some of some of that that knowledge, that learning. I want I want to pick up on something you said, which has just stuck in my head as soon as you said it. And I'm sure that people have written entire PhD theses and <laughs> books about this. But when you said one of the first things uh, that's offered in these learning modules is about the ethics of mm. robotics. Mm. Uh, what do you mean by that? And what are the main ethical considerations people need to be mindful of? There's a lot. Uh, <laughs> and it, it strikes me that in my research community, you go to robotics conference and all these roboticists from around the world come together and we have a good time and we chat. We very f don't talk much about the dark side of, of robotics, which is a bit a bit worrying. So it sort of occurred to me if I'm teaching robotics, I should at least cover that. Mm. In the book that I've, that I've written, uh, you know, I've added a little bit about ethics in there as well. I'm not an ethicist, but I've taken, taken an interest and I think it's something I need to sensitize students to about. So uh, jobs is clearly an, is an obvious one, right? Uh, a lot of humans' self-esteem is, is wrapped up in, in your job. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure why that is, but anyway. Self-esteem and survival, I, I imagine. Yeah, uh, survival first, but self-esteem is there. So if you know, robots do all the work, then what do the people do? And you know, if you have billions of people, not, nothing to do, that's not going to end well. Mm. So you know, jobs, jobs is a really important issue. I think then there are other, other ones around the, the weaponization of robots. So you have robot soldiers instead of having human soldiers. So then you can have a war at no cost, to, mm. essentially no cost uh, to people on, on your side. Mm. And that maybe lead people to, to think, uh, think badly. Mm. Uh, if you can have wars with no, with no consequences or casualties on your side. I mean, the, war, the way that wars are ca carried out already are very different to wars a generation ago, and are largely that's and because a lot. of the introduction of robotics to, to warfare. Correct. So it's a lot of, if you like, robotic technology, automation technology, perception technology in you know, a smart missile. You can just fire it and it'll find the target and, and hit it. That's essentially, that's essentially a robot. Uh, but if you've got things that people are talking about, worried about, is a weapon, they could recognise a particular person mm. you know, by their face you know, and take them out. That would be, uh, that's possible. And there are discussions in the United Nations at the moment about outlawing um, some of this stuff, call them lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, so there's 
there's conversations going on around outlawing them, but United Nations got a pretty patchy record of uh, outlawing uh, classes of weapons, and the United States still doesn't sign up to uh, uh, anti personnel mines, right? Uh, so, mm. yeah. yeah. So that, that's problematic. Another big one's privacy. Mm -hmm. And so you have these robots and they've got eyes, this is my thing, I want robots that can see. And okay, so where the things that the robot's seeing, where does that go? Right? Does it go into the cloud to be processed? And then who can see what's who can see through your, your robot's eyes? I've got a, a robot vacuum cleaner. Uh, it's got cameras, it's a fairly recent one, so it does nice straight line navigation through my house. <laughs> it recognize it uses it uses the camera to recognise where it is in the house. And so it occurred to me one day, I wonder who can see those pictures. Mm. I've got no idea. Uh, mm. So, you know, that's important. I mean, with drone technology, you know, there's issues around privacy there, you know, people being spied on, you know, in the house from, 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 from drones. So, so I think they're the, the big ones. I think it, it, it's jobs, it's warfare, mm. um, and it's and privacy. I think I've heard uh, roughly seven episodes of Black Mirror uh, in, in those things that you've just brought up, <laughs> in all of those issues you brought up just then. Um, thank you so much for guiding us through that, because I think that's all definitely food for thought, that, from which none of us um, can divorce ourselves, given the reality of robots com yeah. coming into our society and how they're used. Um, with your piece, Shoal, uh, this is the second last day of Curiosity Brisbane, and so Shoal has been out there for quite some time. People have been engaging with this work of art that also mm. relies on robotics too. What have been your favourite reactions or most memorable reactions from people so far as they've uh, looked at and engaged with Shoal? Yeah, I actually think the most memorable was about 45 minutes ago when we came past it. There was a um, there was a, a group of, I don't want to say young people, but probably in their early 20s who walked through and, you know, it's the sort of people that you go like, oh, I wonder how they're going to interact with this piece of public art. And, um, and they started playing a game of chase with the fish around mm. it and they were just <laughs> looping it and the thing, the, yeah, you know, things going a little bit haywire and spasming, but it was like, yeah, just... It was quite delightful. I guess it's, it is a moment of, um, of witnessing exactly the sort of intervention, I guess, in that public space that I hope that that would have, that, you know, they're on their way from City Beach to the cinema, God knows what, you know, but like, <laughs> yeah. you get to have a, yeah, a game of run around with a school of fish in the middle of the mall. Like, awesome. That's really, yeah, that's, really that's cool. That's definitely one of them. But, but there's an interesting thing with, with, with human beings and robots, yeah. is that they want to test its limits. Yep. Uh, this, mm. is, this is, you see this all of the time. You have robots and we have them in open day or whatever, people jump in front of it because they expect it to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm, no, no, I've been doing robots for a long time. I, it's probably one of the last things I would do is jump in front, of a, <laughs> yeah. in front of a robot. And if there are young kids there, I mean, they'll climb all over it. They'll torment <laughs> torment robots terribly, yeah, uh, yeah. particularly young boys. Yeah. Uh, this is another the, ethical conversation. It Can is. we torture robots? And there's actually, <laughs> I've seen at least two academic papers on, on this about mm. children tormenting robots. Because <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> they kind of feel us, and I think they probably have a mental model of the robot that's way more sophisticated than the robot actually is. Because they've seen robots on television, mm. right? they know what robots are. Uh, you know, these super intelligent, you know, yes. benevolent things. Yeah. And it's not, that's not necessarily a valid model to so have. So we should be worried about the future of robots, but we should just be worried about children in general, <laughs> is, is a takeaway. Yeah, it goes without saying. <laughs> hey, look, while I've got the both of you here, something that I've been asking across um, the Curious Conversations is just like, can you give us some cool trivia about the work that you've made, about robotics in general? Had a really great conversation um, with people who were experts in mycelium, which is um, you know the, the building blocks of fungi and mushrooms and things that can grow all over the place they were telling me things about fungi that had never occurred to me that I didn't know the fact that most fungi in the world is not known not named we don't we don't actually know what's out there if you go out to certain parts of the world and look at fungi 
um, that have not been really documented. Roughly four out of five of the things that you'll see have not been named or discovered oh. properly in science, which is still blowing my mind. Um, tell me some things about Shoal that you know that we wouldn't just simply by looking at it and engaging with it. Yeah, the th look, the thing that sort of blew my brain a little bit when we were working on this project, um, the, our creative producer who's pushed it through to realisation, um, Matt Siri, uh, bought on board a, a charitable partner for us to work with, you know, because mm. we're going, we're, we're putting this thing in the city, we want to make a thing, like we need to find a, a hookup here that, you know, we can we can help with the story. Um, and so the Reef Restoration Foundation, who are the foundation we've been working alongside as we've made this, um, they farm coral to replant on reefs. Wow. And I had no idea that this was happening. It's this massive volunteer volunteer network um, based out of Cairns. They um, they head out, uh, yeah, to reefs that have that have been devastated by recent bleaching events and, and harvest the species of coral that are there to then grow them in highly fertile safe waters mm. um, which amplifies their growth rate by something like six times so that they can then be replanted on the damaged reef wow. and I just um, I, I guess I wasn't aware that there was that sort of like positive action taking place to combat these bleaching events and yeah that was my sort of like oh wow that's awesome. a really, really cool. moment of hope in it. Like, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it was really yeah. Great. absolutely. And what a great way to trigger off conversations about what reef preservation and restoration actually looks like through your work. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, they were actually the ones too when we were speaking with them who mentioned that it feels like there is such a divide between you know the woke metropolitan centres who who care so much about these issues but are so physically distant from mm. them that the actual reality of it sometimes maybe doesn't register home mm. beyond a political agenda. And I think that that for us was, yeah, made it feel more important to land a work like this in a place like this mm. and also to look at where else we can take it to bring those issues, yeah, that are, that are otherwise so distant and landed on our doorstep. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of facts and figures yeah. about robotics that uh, one, have terrified us, but two, um, <laughs> are probably really delightful and mind-blowing. What are some facts and figures up your sleeve or trivia about robotics so that two, can blow our mind? Two things come to mind, and one just following up on, on David's point. One of my colleagues at QT, a guy called Matthew Dunbabin, he builds underwater robots. And the thing that he's uh, been a lot over the last two years is taking coral spawn, uh, which has been captured and grown on for a bit, and then using a robot submarine, which is the thing about this long, to actually deposit that. And so it, it goes with a sort of a bladder full of this coral spawn. It's, it swims along like a, like a robot vacuum cleaner, really. It just <laughs> does a sort of lawnmower pattern backwards and forwards, and, but only squirts them out on places where it's prospective for them to take root. So if, there's, you know, if it's seagrass or sand, it won't squirt them out because they'll go nowhere there. So he's working with marine biologists to, to sort of help reseed the, the reef. Wow. I mean, the reef is in terrible strife. That's because of collectively all of us. And there's no, there's no quick solution to fixing the reef. I mean, we have, you know, it's going to take centuries. But what you can do is probably fix it where it's been damaged and probably encourage it to grow south. Mm. Right, where the waters are, waters are cooler. So that's using using robots to try and do some restoration. It's a band aid. It's not the right solution to the problem, mm. but it's the best thing we can do mm. at the moment. So that's that that that's one. And the second one I'd like to mention. It's a really interesting link between robots and theatre. Is the word robot came from a play, right? A <clears throat> hundred years ago, this year, uh, there was a play called Rossum's Universal Robots, written by a, a Czech playwright, uh, Karl Chapek. Uh, and he introduced this idea of a robot. So it was a humanoid, uh, human-like machine that did the work uh, of people. Uh, so they were manufactured and they were used to do the drudgy work. So robot actually is a, is a word from the Czech language that's got some aspect of, of uh, serfdom, slavery, mm. uh, horrible labor. Right, and that's what the word robot means. It's a Czech word, now, 100 years old this year. Uh, and in that play, the robots get jack of that, 
and they rise up and they kill the humans. Right? <laughs> Something to look forward to. You've probably seen that movie. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a Czech play from 100 years ago. Wow, I love that you brought that full circle. Did you know, did you know that? I didn't that? know that. No, that's amazing. <laughs> Back pocket, that one. <laughs> it's great how optimistic it is too. <laughs> from the start. <laughs> that's uh, really a beautiful point to throw it to um, the audience because we've got time for questions from all of you. We don't have a roving mic or anything but it's resonant room but if you do ask a question I'll repeat it so uh, we can ensure that everyone hears it. Other questions from the crowd? Yes, one up here. I've got a question for Professor. Do we contribute to deep learning when we indicate that we are not a robot by identifying the bridges yes. or the bicycles in the image? Yes, you oh. do. Okay. And someone's collecting that and saying, I've now got 50 people that think that's a bridge. Yep. Oh. So all of those things where you have to say, please identify the traffic lights or the bridge yeah. in this image, we are contributing to a robot's deep learning Correct. and understanding of what a bridge is. So it's no use having a bazillion pictures of things if you don't know what are the objects within that. So there is this, uh, this problem we call the data labeling problem. So you've got a picture and a human has to say, what's in that picture and so they started off just mining pictures from Facebook and Instagram and and so on which generally you know, people say this is my cat or this is my dog and the picture with that you could most reasonably say you know the, the dominant thing in that is probably a keyword out of the text mm. associated with social media posts but that's kind of noisy and imprecise data so there are companies uh, that do this data labeling and that's one way of getting data labeling done for free that's so interesting. So even though, so ostensibly, it's about us proving to a computer that we are human. Like, mm. make sure that you're ticking the right thing so that we know that you're not a bot. Mm -hmm. But what we're also doing is contributing to the data that creates something, well, that facilitates learning of AI. Yep. I think given that the, it's almost always traffic lights, pedestrian crossings, or, or bridges, or buses. Robots, they're really obsessed with buses yeah, so and traffic lights. I think maybe in the day it probably had some merit, but I, I can't imagine that today that data would be particularly useful. But, uh, I've seen scripts, like uh, obviously it's an image of a, an ancient document or a, an older type document. Mm -hmm. And obviously sometimes the E's and the T's are all a bit out. Yep. They're the, they're, the heart, they're the harder ones. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and I think if you try a million people to say that's a T, mm. they'll probably say, well, learn that, that yeah. T can be a T or that way or that one. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Which is, I think, you know, ways that they can improve the ability to recognise handwritten, handwritten text. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your question. There's a question here. I quit them all in January this year. I'm no, still I, off. I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to ask you what's your take because a lot of people say, oh, don't use social media because the government's stealing your information or, you know, like targeted marketing. I'm like, I actually quite like the targeted marketing. <laughs> <laughs> so the comment... You're their kind of person. <laughs> So, so the comment or the question there is, uh, tried quitting Facebook recently, had to go back on, couldn't function without it. What's your take on quitting social media? You've discovered that uh, as much as da data is being harvested, you don't mind it being harvested for targeted marketing, but you've actually quit them all recently. I, I quit them. Uh, I, I Why? think, f f I mean, Facebook in, in particular, I, I worry about what they, what they do with the data. They're, they're, as they take over other other social media platforms. So, so Facebook is, of course, Facebook the platform, but the company owns WhatsApp, Instagram. Have yep. I missed anything? Uh, at the moment, but yeah, I that's, think that, that's, that's, a, that's that, a lot. That's, the, that's, that's, that's quite a lot. That's the whole lot. Uh, and I think, having seen what's happened, I think over the last couple of years, you know, live stream massacre in New Zealand, uh, just this incredible disinformation, conspiracy theory propagation in the United States. I really just don't think it's a. I don't think it's a force for social good. I'm not sure if this could have been predicted, you know, a long time ago. If you said, "What if you just had everyone in the world connected?" I mean, Zuckerberg just says, "You know, it'll be nice, and we can all share things and be happy." But I've never actually heard him say anything very particularly intelligent. 
so I just, I just worry. I just think it. I don't think. I think it's a bad thing for society, and so I don't decide I'm not going to be any part of it. But to what extent are you talking about this particular platform and its governance, or, or lack thereof, in terms of its policy? It's particular. It's that particular platform and lack of governance or policy, mm. and run by a person who's you know, not elected, and I don't think is very smart. Mm. I think it's a really bad combination for the world. Did so you see the movie The Social Dilemma? No. It's a social network. The yeah. Social Dilemma is a documentary on Netflix, I believe, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Have a look at that. I haven't signed up for Netflix. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, Netflix but, but, is probably more benign than Facebook. Uh, <laughs> but for those, for those of us who haven't seen The Social Dilemma, it's good. I, I really like when we get homework out of these curious conversations. Mm -hmm. Why are you assigning us this homework? Uh, it... I think brings home what it is that the company gets out of having you uh, as a participant. So I guess w we sign up to those things because of what we get out. You know, it's the amenity that it affords us. And we don't pay any money and we get all this loveliness. You know, we get connectivity and targeted marketing. I guess what, the, what that documentary shows is what's in it for them and how they manipulate you uh, to basically do what they want you to do. Mm. So you're a puppet. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And that's not, not a pejorative um, <laughs> all the time, but in this case, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think one is slightly different because I feel like it's such a negative place and the views that it likes to project or, you know, people are just watching cat videos all the time on there. But that's probably the least worst thing you could but, watch. Yeah. So, so, so your argument is that social media is a tool. Can I? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you would say that social media is not neutral. Is that is that fair to say? Because Look, yeah, there are people governing how the social media works. I mean, it's there. It's been built for a reason. I mean, Facebook. If you consider its, you know, its annual electricity consumption, all the computers are in there. I mean, to build that thing is massive piece of money, right? So. They, they, they're trying to get a return on, on that investment. They do that by manipulating people. I think the point is that it amplifies the good, and I get that. And I think that was probably the, the way it was, con uh, well, it was conceived in quite sort of misogynist uh, <laughs> beginnings of Facebook. But put that aside, uh, it was conceived as a way that people could be happy and share nice things. But it can amplify the bad stuff and the stupid stuff. And I think that's, that sort of dawned on me Maybe, maybe a bit late that it has got this very dark side. Because humans have got dark side and it's just a big amplifier. Mm, mm. And I think the, that's quite scary. Mm. Thank you so much for your contribution. There were more questions as we came across this way. We'll take that one and then that one. Yes. Hi. Uh, this is a question to the professor. Firstly, you want to point with your socks? I really like them. Yeah. The robot yeah, socks? Yeah. yeah. The comment was his <laughs> socks are, are on point. They have robots on them. That, that's my comment. So, but no, just to, just Mm. You know, self-driving vehicles. Um, there's, there's been research that the most efficient way of actually driving is through the use of roundabouts, but for some crazy reason, the vehicles cannot actually negotiate roundabouts. So is that a deep learning type of scenario that the automated vehicles have to go through, or is that a different type of learning that they've got to learn how to react to a roundabout? So the question's about automated driving, and it's been shown that um, automated driving systems in their current state have huge problems with roundabouts. Reminds me of when I was a learner driver. Um, uh, what's, what's the go there? Is there, is there deep learning that needs to be applied there, and can it be? I'm not sure if round. I've heard the story, and I'm not sure if it's, it's true or whether it's an urban, urban legend. It's a nice story. Um, 
Roundabouts are not very common in the US, mm. which is where a lot of this work's happening. So uh, I think they call them traffic circles and it terrifies them when they drive outside the United States. I remember when I went to the United States, they had these things called four-way stops. Mm. So there's a, a cross junction, everyone's got a stop sign. Well, what the hell? So you, know, you, go, you go there and everyone's stopped and you all kind of look at each other and then someone goes. Uh, they find them more terrifying. So it, Yeah. My family is actually US based. Yeah. Um, so in Australia, our roundabout is about giving way to the right. Mm. But in the US, it's about who gets there first. Mm. That's why they don't have any. So right. when everyone gets there, they look at each other and they're like, <coughs> right. So, so, so uh, in the, round, the roundabout is about giving way to people from a certain direction. In the US, it's about who gets there first. It's a very Amer American mentality. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you get your hand done, right? Uh, um, but but on that point, yeah. are, are there ways that uh, automated cars, self-driving cars, will be able to broach the horrors of driving through roundabouts. Yeah, so a lot of the road, the road rules that are, or the driving rules are embedded in the cars come from two things. One is by monitoring human drivers. So there are lots of test drivers just drive around, you mine all of that for, for data. Uh, but most of that driving is happening in the US where there aren't many, many roundabouts. Uh, even, I mean, Teslas, as they're driving manually or autonomously, they're also logging data and sending it back. Uh, so that's how they will. That's how they will learn. Mm -hmm. uh, the capture cards that we use about, you know, the, uh, <laughs> right. the buses that come. Yeah. That's all what it's for. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's, it's a mixture of engineers kind of typing, typing rules, typing rules in. But then, yeah, we don't we don't obey the rules 100 percent of the time, right? Because mm. it'd be unsafe. You can't do things like overtaking and so on. So we have some discretion, and we probably each have got ideas of how much discretion we have when we're driving. That's the hard thing to embed in the, in the robot, that sort of more soft, that softer knowledge. Mm. Thank you so much for your question. One here. Uh, one comment, if you want to do more homework on the impact of social media on society, listen to the rabbit hole. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, one more bit of homework, if you want to learn more <laughs> about the impact of uh, types of social media um, on society, the rabbit hole podcast, an incredible uh, podcast from the New York Times, which more specifically focused on algorithms, not not just solely, but more specifically focused on algorithms from memory uh, surrounding YouTube and Google's responsibility around that, looking at how um, young men, young American men in particular, but m people across the world have become radicalised through YouTube's algorithms. Mm. Yeah. Through deep learning, do robots have the potential to learn emotions? It's a good question. Uh, when you, you have a deep learning system, right? You have a, you can think of it as a, as a black box, right? So perceptions go in, actions come out. The way that the, what's inside the black box we don't quite understand, right? You could say it's just a million numbers. Right? But that represents something, but it's not obvious what, it, you can look at each particular number and say, I mean, what does that number mean? We don't know what it means. It's like looking at an individual neuron in your brain and saying, well, what does that neuron represent? We don't really know. Uh, so internally, does the robot, is there some sense of emotion inside that black box? I don't know. Uh, I don't think we, we will know. Is it useful for robots to have emotions? Is it, is it sort of a different question? And it probably is. Uh, if robots are interacting with us, uh, we're very good at recognizing, reading people's emotions. So already there are robots that can flag uh, an emotional condition. Uh, I mean, it's not real, but the robot can look confused if it doesn't understand what you mean. And so robots with very simple, simplistic, cartoony faces can look confused. Or if it you know, wants to get through and people aren't letting it get through, it can look angry. It isn't really angry. It's saying, I want to go that way and there's someone in my way, so I'll pretend to look angry. And humans understand angry and then they'll get out of my way. Uh, it's quicker and easier than saying, excuse me, could you get out of my way? Mm. Just look angry and the person will just move. So we're already starting to do that in robotics. Robots can also read people's emotional state 
And so if you know, the person looks confused or the person looks angry, then maybe you do a different thing. Mm. Uh, if you try to look angry, they looked angry back, then you think, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, can I expand on that question? Because as robots and AI inevitably becomes rapidly more intelligent, I think that for a lot of us, there's the assumption that that results in sentience. But are they the same thing? Does, does intelligence eventually become sentience, or are they actually two separate things? I don't think we, I'm not sure if we know yet what sentience is. I guess that's the big fear, right? That's, you know, when, when robots become sentient and, and take, take over. Do you see I mean, that as an inevitability? <laughs> that we see it as an inevitability that, that robots will only get smarter and smarter and smarter, but does that necessarily mean they become conscious? I think we, again, we don't know quite enough about about consciousness and what it and, and what mm. it, it means. I mean, part of it is a is a sense of self, a sense of self awareness, and that's got a, I think, an evolutionary advantage. If you're aware of yourself, uh, and you know, if you're aware of yourself, then you don't want to do things that are going to damage yourself, right? Uh, that's a sort of self-preservation thing. So I think to have self-preservation, you need to have some knowledge of, of, of self mm. uh, and probably to have some ability to be, to be selfish and to have goals and do the things to achieve the goals that you need to do as, as an individual. Mm. Uh, so whether that's sentience or not, I don't know. It must have an evolutionary advantage, mm. right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have consciousness. Most, we, we do almost everything because it's got an evolutionary advantage. Mm. So maybe it's something you have to put build into robots if you mm. want them to be to survive. Interesting questions. Yeah. Very interesting questions. And on that existential riddle that will haunt you for the rest of the weekend, <laughs> we might have to leave it there. I'm so grateful that you all spent the time um, this morning to come out here for Curiosity Brisbane for this particular curious conversation. Um, before we wrap up, we've just got a few thank yous to the Queensland Government through, the tur through Tourism and Events Queensland, to Brisbane City Council through the Brisbane Economic Development Agency for their support of Curiosity Brisbane. Uh, thanks also to Curiosity Brisbane's major partner, the Korea Mail, media partner Nine Queensland and Curious Conversations partner NBN Co uh, who are providing the support for us to live stream these morning's uh, conversations globally. And finally, thank you to our precincts partners where you can find all the curiosity experiences, Brisbane City Council, South Bank Parkland, Arts Queensland, State Library of Queensland and Queensland Museum. But could you please join me in saving our last round of thanks for our wonderful guests today, Peter and David. Thank you. Thank you.